I'd like to introduce our final speaker um, before we move over to the chat conversation at the conclusion, uh, Lawrence Bath, on a paper called Type and Urban Strategy. I can't tell you um, what a <coughs> pleasure it is um, to uh, be able to be the final speaker uh, when uh, all that has gone before has said pretty much everything that needs to be said on the, uh, on the topic. Um, and um, especially when um, the, uh, there's such a wonderful feeling of uh, community amongst um, the, uh, um, my, my fellows, having Pavlos and uh, Sam and Tasha and Katerina all here, it's, uh, it's really very, very special for me. So I um, have to thank you for this. Um, the, um, I'm not used to uh, the way in which uh, this works on Apple. Sorry, it's taking me so long. Um, I'm, now I'm going to deviate from the, from the title that I uh, originally gave, which was uh, Type and Urban Strategy, and because I, I want to emphasize something like capacity building. And uh, part of the reason that I want to do that actually has to do with the relationship between these last two uh, presentations. The, um, the, the th I think one of the things that we notice in Pavlos's uh, discussion is that there's this incredibly rich intellectual potential within type. And at the same time, it's very difficult to know exactly how that will allow us to deal with the sort of problem that Chris is identifying uh, in New York. In other words, how do we go from these very reasoned understandings of what is there in the, in the special project by a learned architect, you know, working at the height of their powers, and what's the relationship between that and the, the emergence of these pencil towers that is likely to lead us pretty much right back to uh, something like uh, the, the uh, uh, London vernacular. And the, the other motivation in this is that recently I've been uh, moving kind of back and forth between needing to comment on what's going on in London in relation to uh, the strengths and weaknesses of our plans here and um, an exploration of the way in which our lessons might be transferred to problems in Moscow. And I was, I was recently invited to, to Moscow to talk about the way in which a, uh, a polycentric city like London uh, was maintaining some kind of quality in its developments at the, uh, at, at the periphery. Who was taking responsibility for plans along the, uh, the Thames as we moved out beyond uh, City Airport? And who was maintaining responsibility for coherence and a vision uh, when we look at plans for the, uh, for the London legacy development area? And one of the things that became clear to me was that um, in these projects, it's very, very difficult to uh, to show that indeed London presents a positive answer to these questions. That is, London's not very good at explaining how you use typological reasoning or any kind of governmental control uh, at uh, producing something like a polycentric city where there's any sort of command over vision, over equity, uh, over uh, the, um, the potentials of a, of a truly urban life. And, um, and so one of the things that I found myself uh, feeling in Moscow was that I had been uh, invited mistakenly, that uh, we really had relatively little to offer. Um, but I decided that instead what we needed to do is to clarify some of the difficulties that we have in London planning. And to do that, I, I want to start with this image, uh, which I think in, in a very banal way, uh, y many of you will recognize this is the St. Giles Project in the, uh, by uh, Renzo Piano in the center of London. And my, my very great colleague, Anna Shapiro, tells me she not only dislikes this project, but hates it. 
Um, but one of the things that I, um, I, uh, I find interesting about it is, however we may feel about it, there are a series of events that seem to take place uh, in, in the uh, plaza uh, at the heart of this St. Giles project that seem not so much to insist upon a typological intelligence, but seem to tell us something about history. Um, that is, if we can say that history in the way in which Fashid Musavi might uh, want us to understand it in the sense that we are in the presence of a new style, a new style of work or perhaps something where the, uh, the city has become a, um, uh, a, a subject to a condition which we live at work and we work at home. Um, now these kinds of uh, experiences also seem to me to say something of the, of the way in which um, uh, Kohlhaas has described um, the event structure of a project perhaps exceeding uh, that which is simply programmed in a project. In other words, we can have activities that we may not entirely anticipate. Now, um, when we look at this sort of project, to me what I do like about it, and I have these discussions with Anna fairly regularly, is that whatever the quality of the architecture, and the, um, a very commercial project here seems to have enabled us to decide that we can put social housing, uh, a relatively high quality public realm, and a very generic office building all in the same parcel and in, in, in some sort of uh, singular sense, allow it to do some work uh, on what was um, a, a very differently conceived part of London. Now, in other words, thinking, and, and the reason why I began that uh, with the first image from the inside out, was to build on that point that has been made repeatedly today, that uh, properly understood um, an architecture of typology begins by thinking about the inside, in a way, and reasoning outward uh, uh, into the, uh, a range of effects that a building has on an urban system. Now, um, I just kind of want to make a few other points um, that I guess that I'm feeling fairly strongly about these days. I'm, I'm deeply annoyed about the London vernacular. Um, I'm, uh, I also think that we have vastly overstated in urbanism an emphasis upon the public realm. Uh, I think that we have, uh, in addition, um, uh, I think this, this whole understanding of urbanism as placemaking um, has been uh, nothing short of a disaster for, uh, for governance in places like London. And uh, I think these are all things that the typological um, uh, emphasis all seem to contest. Now, th the reason why I, I say these things can partly be, um, uh, is, is partly as a result of thinking also further about what I was witnessing in Moscow. Moscow has done a really terrific job of using the vast wealth of the city uh, to create a, a number of really remarkable parks. Uh, they've put much greater emphasis than one would have imagined possible on a, uh, improved street life and pedestrian life and bicycle pathways and so on in such a way that you can see that the government is able to say, look, you know, we're, we're giving you the public realm you asked for. What more could you want? Um, and in a sense, one of the things that I suppose these kind of banal images show is that what we are really trying to do in this particular moment of history is to clarify how new collaborations become possible. How new, if, if to take up Chris's point, it really is about a civic life, but it's about a civic life where we build capacity, build trust, understand how to work together to achieve things that may be in some ways rather novel, like putting social housing, a commercial office building, and a relatively successful public realm together in such a way that people start to do new things uh, in the center of London. Now, uh, this is something that I feel that the, um, when we look at the London Development Corpor uh, Legacy Development Corporation's plans for, uh, uh, for the Lee Valley, uh, it's you know, strikingly missing, you know, all of these things are strikingly missing from its understanding of 
how to control the plan. Now, one of the things then that I kind of want to do is to begin to, uh, to ask the question, why do other places do a better job of, uh, of converting an architectural understanding to a plan than we do in London? Now, some of that just has to do with the histories of, of London where we, we root um, uh, our planning competence in the boroughs where they don't have any particular capacity to uh, think strategically because they're just too small. Uh, Peter Bishop, who's uh, you know, been one to, to clarify exactly why St. Giles came about you know, and how it worked, that is, brought a few people together, got them talking, is in a way also been able to point out that that's also one of the difficulties of London. What if you could imagine that Hackney and Islington could talk to each other then we wouldn't have had the missed opportunities and disasters that we see around Finsbury Park and Manor House. Um, so if we could get people talking to each other, we might do something a little bit different. Now, um, my argument is that typological reasoning of the sort that Pavlos and Katerina and Sam are pointing toward um, begins to give us a series of tools that we might use, in a sense, upstream in the design process so we get people conceiving of different kinds of collaborative potentials. And it has to do with a different way of understanding freedom and action, which I'll come to in a moment. But some of what Peter Bishop is arguing is that if we, if we could just get people talking together a little bit better, relinquish our emphasis upon regulatory and restrictive planning, um, and emphasize instead strategic planning, the creation of visions, the management of visions, the management of change, then acceptance of transformation, all of these things that we would be able to achieve more. So here in Paris, we see an exploration uh, of, um, uh, of a perimeter block housing, which then follows on, we get an exploration of point block housing, all within the same plan. A part of that comes about at the same time that France is rethinking their planning structure. And they're, they're moving away from regulatory and restrictive planning and starting to move in the direction of enabling in, the, in a series of laws in 1999 and 2000 to enable the possibility of jurisdictions to collaborate with one another across their boundaries, to relinquish their emphasis upon restrictive planning and to talk with one another about what might be possible rather than what is disallowed. Now, I think in, in some ways what we can see in this plan for Reeve Gauche is that, you know, it's, it's really just a land use plan, but a rather nicely thought out one that begins to enable, uh, enable designers to think about the potentials in a particular type. So here we have an example of, of something that begins to uh, allow designers to think about the possibility of the displacement of concepts within an adherence to tradition along the lines of what Pavlos has just been describing. Now, I think that in, in many respects, this is distinctly different than our uh, emphasis upon the London vernacular. So if we look at the London vernacular sort of guidance that we're giving, um, um, the one of the uh, key benefits or a series of the key benefits that are proposed by those who are uh, suggesting we ought to adhere to something like a London vernacular is that it reduces risk. Now it's meant to reduce risk because it clarifies what, you know, what people really want uh, and it's meant to reduce risk because it helps us to understand what land values ought to be and what development costs ought to be. And so it's claimed that it does a series of things that reduce risk. Um, but it seems that at the same moment that it does so, it disables our capacity to work with the historical moment in which we are. That it in fact uh, does a series of things to restrict our ability to uh, address the moment where we are actually trying to change, trying to do things differently. So if we think, for example, of, you know, I'm, I'm seeing Charles Scott and Anna Shapiro here in the audience, and I'm realizing what Charles was up against in his planning of Sweetwater, where the restrictions put in place upon his, uh, up, upon the density and his ability to define the park edge 
were so unbearably uh, constraining, it seems to me, by the London Legacy Development um, uh, team that, uh, in fact, there was very, very little scope for achieving, in fact, what that project ought to achieve. Um, we could go on ab about the, the details of that particular plan, but in a sense you can see that it's nothing like uh, what is being aimed for in uh, Paris Rive Gauche, even though there are many conditions that are quite similar. Uh, and in fact, the way in which a development model linking university to housing and so on is being pursued and uh, was being pursued in the Rive Gauche model is, is just far more uh, interesting and effective and, and ambitious. Now, um, I, many of you know that I've talked a lot about the, the plan for um, uh, Hafen City in Hamburg. And so I want to focus in again on, on some of these, these uh, first projects at the early phase where uh, a series of very small, um, very uh, uh, let's say easily repeatable types um, uh, form the um, the first series of projects of the built part as opposed to the refurbished part of the Hoffman City project, beginning to establish a presence on the waterfront. Now, the whole logic of this plan was conceived against the problem of risk. So exactly what we claim we're trying to do with the London vernacular, uh, this is doing in a completely different way. So on a, on a challenging waterfront, it doesn't say, I want you to keep things as small as you possibly could because I'm really worried that you, know, you, might, um, uh, you, you might not get residents with, um, with front doors onto the streets or I'm really worried that you won't look like a Victorian terrace system like we all think is so great. But by the way, how did we ever get to the point where we thought that the terrace system was really great and flexible? If, if, I mean, have any of you ever been out to Southgate? Um, I mean, there are so many parts of London that work so dismally bad on, uh, on the basis of the London terrace structure and how we could sort of pretend that every time you get a terrace system, you have a street uh, or a successful street is beyond my ability to understand. Furthermore, the notion that the, the terraced house is a flexible dwelling. Has anybody ever noticed how much uh, work we put into bashing the walls apart to try to get them to do what we want them to do today? I mean, they are com distinctly uh, uh, out of a step with contemporary living. Um, perhaps a point we might want to come back to. But what these, uh, in fact, do is to say, all right, we're going to take some types that extend a logic from Hamburg but are not, in fact, identical with anything we would have seen in Hamburg up to that point. But there are a number of conceptual displacements that I, one can easily trace with a normal Hamburg uh, building pattern. But what you get are a series of, uh, of, of buildings that are agnostic about use, um, but that are uh, reasoned on the basis that the developers, and there are several developers involved, should all be, along with their, uh, with their stakeholders and future tenants, thinking about what is possible not what is what should be deemed impossible. So they're all focused by a kind of typological reasoning to continue an existing tradition and to vary it in such a way that you're trying to get in a very low risk way, the simple type, anybody can build it, um, uh, to people to do much, much more than they thought was possible on a new waterfront. And so what we end up with is a, something that we might think of as fundamental uh, to a kind of typological reasoning if we try to extend that to the problem of the plan, a plan for the mundane, let's say. Um, now, in, in this, what we do get is a sense that there's the type, as many have been saying, is about repeatability or it's about repetition. It's about coherence, it's about legibility, and so on. So if we say that one of the things that typological reasoning ought to produce, if we uh, say it's about being prospective and looking forward and not just analytical in the past. It's about producing coherence and variation at the same time. I think this is something that we can see in this project. Now, 
One of the commentators whom I like the most on these kinds of issues is Jeffrey Kipnis. And every time I pick up anything he writes, uh, I find myself being inspired once again at what the field of architecture achieves. And he's consistent in always looking at the issue of architectural values, specifically architectural values, always returning to the autonomy of architecture. What is it that architects can do that nobody else can do? Um, and what is it that they contribute to a kind of reasoning uh, that allows us to think about what the city can become uh, in ways that are more than what we would have any reason to expect by simply looking around us and seeing the everyday. Uh, it's a kind of invention and innovation that is so fundamental to the, what Kipnis sees in the work of architects. Now, at the same time, he's always very, very interested in insisting that we pay close attention to the buildings themselves. Now, this is exactly what I feel that, you know, the kind of thing that Pavlis has just been doing, and I think is absolutely so essential. He's not looking at some sort of, um, um, he hasn't been looking at some kind of relationship to a grand history or to any sort of meta narrative. He actually spends a lot of time just understanding the particular conceptual displacements in the architecture. Now, it's that intelligence that we have to begin to clarify how that is extended to the plan rather than simply backwards to the analysis. And this uh, is something then that, if, if you think about where it fits in the design process, can only be done as you bring together people in, into a, a kind of um, a, a form of action, if I can put it that way, a form of practical action in relation to city building that is very, very different than regulatory planning. Now, I was taught at uh, UCLA by John Friedman, and uh, one of Friedman's four uh, main traditions of planning, he called planning as social learning. And uh, under the heading of planning as social learning, he suggested that uh, a lot of planning really kind of proceeds in a way without a plan. So if we, if we come back, you know, I challenged um, uh, Sam this morning on the question of what was going on in the relationship between history and, and some of those, you know, wonderfully gorgeous and evocative, but in some way kind of static plans that Ungers uh, um, drew. And in a way, the argument that Friedman was making was that one of the core traditions of planning was one in which small groups of people, and it was always relatively small groups of people, came together and found ways to uh, understand, conceptualize, and address new forms of problem based on grasping a particular moment in time. Now, I think that's something of what we can see happening in a project like Hoffman City. Um, that is, um, a, a, a relatively small group of people come together. And when I say a small group of people, it's not so much that there aren't many, many projects, but the way in which the work is handled is always in the form of creating relatively small groups and then discussing the potential in, in design in relation to an overall, um, uh, an overall ambition for the project. Now, it starts to suggest then that the way you would use typological reasoning is in trying to constitute sort of uh, uh, teams where there's a certain amount of freedom of action. Um, now, when, when Kipnis discusses um, uh, uh, the work of morphosis, he's really very interesting in, in um, uh, suggesting that when you look at the work of morphosis, a lot of what they, um, is, is on show is a kind of spectacular capacity to deal with conditions when they're extremely complex, and then to produce a kind of coherence um, in ways that do not conform to type, do not conform to any pattern in which the, uh, the, um, uh, the expression of legibility is based upon in, uh, the function of what's going on inside. Instead, it's always based on, in a sense, material effects, formal relations, how a building reacts to sight, uh, how the ground is articulated, the way in which a building uh, the building's effects extend into the city and so on. Now, these are all the kinds of architectural topics or themes 
uh, as several of the authors have, uh, or, or today's speakers have emphasized, these are the kinds of themes that I think are most appropriate to a typological discussion. So it's coherence then, but not at a visual, in a visual sense. Coherence instead at a conceptual level. So it's the concept, in a sense, that starts to become the means of bringing, um, uh, bringing coherence. Now, I would say that these projects here uh, they probably still are more or less on the side of the optical or the visual. It gives us still further scope, I would imagine, to think about a conceptual coherence that could equally well uh, uh, establish a new kind of waterfront. Now, even so, one of the things about this project is, is that even at a kind of optical level, um, it seems to me that it is far less reductive than the London vernacular. But in fact, part of the reason that it is so is that we can see that the emphasis upon achieving more and differentiating one building from another on the basis that each you've got you know, eight different developers all working together, eight different sets of stakeholders, eight different kinds of, uh, uh, of, of tenant bases and tenant relationships. That's very, very different than what we end up doing in London, where we are often held hostage to uh, a, a major house builder as the lead developer and the idea that coherence should be achieved by simply having a kind of repetition uh, of something that looks more or less the same. Now, um, the, there are a, a number of, of points that um, I would like to sort of bring out perhaps about uh, type and typology. And be, before I kind of go on to that, just a couple more things about the Hoffman City Plan. Many of the uh, individual developers who were active in the first phase went on to build in the second phase. So this photo, as many of you know, who've uh, uh, talked with me about this before, uh, this photo is taken where several different developers are involved in phase two. Uh, so again, very unlike our London pattern. So you can see as phase one is here on the right, and phase two, as you can see, appearing on the left. As we push on to the emergence of a new corporate building for Unilever, they've been pressed into a kind of collaborative attitude where they are uh, encouraged. In fact, it, it, it's demanded of them that they build housing along with their, uh, their corporate uh, headquarters, and so they put the Marco Polo Tower up next to it. And at the same time that this is going on here, I'm looking across the way, and there's, there's already people uh, beginning to make use of the, uh, of, an in, of the public realm. So this public realm, as you can see, is uh, in action, in, in sort of in active, already working at a period of time that the construction is still ongoing all around it. Again, something that we're not particularly good at achieving in London in, that, in terms of uh, getting that level of interactivity at the same time that we're still building. So, you know, we, we see that there's an emergence of an everyday pattern of life where living and working are sort of being brought into contact with one another, something like that uh, event structure beginning to exceed the program itself that Kohlhaas is interested in. And on the right, again, the Unilever and the Marco Polo housing tower um, it juxtaposed with one another in such a way that the Unilever's ground floor can uh, be almost in here. There's a little cafe. It's uh, almost, in a sense, juxtaposition or, or a resource for the housing community itself. Now, all of these examples that I've shown, they all have room for improvement. It, I'm not trying to suggest that they are the pinnacle of architectural achievement. I'm not even sort of saying that they're great examples of architecture. I'm looking at them more as an understanding of where we are in a historical moment. Uh, that is, that a series of juxtapositions are possible and, in fact, are normal uh, the, uh, because of where we are. And, in fact, we're not paying nearly enough attention to them in our London planning. Now, uh, again, um, here's another example from The Hague. So 
you know, you get a, a bereft little part of The Hague hidden on the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, and uh, along comes Jean Busquets and says, I don't see why we shouldn't be able to build tall. Uh, and uh, he puts these, these wonder, you know, uh, you, you, of course there's investment in transport infrastructure, but puts these wonderful towers on top of um, uh, some little courtyard developments. Behind me, there's two and three story housing across the park. Now, why we can't do a similar thing in London, uh, where we have a, you know, a ridiculously problematic housing situation and start to put up uh, taller housing on park edges. Why Charles should be limited to two and three, or three and four story Georgian terraces at the edge of, uh, of Queen Elizabeth Park and, until he sneaks in some wonderful towers, you know, as part of a further phase. But, um, you know, the, the idea I think would be that typological reasoning uh, works not only to help us displace concepts, but to understand appropriate uh, application of what we learn from other cases at a particular moment in history. So it allows us, you know, here we've got something that would work pretty well with the London vernacular in terms of fenestration, in terms of material effects, in terms of how it hits the ground and yet is quite clear that the emphasis should be upon a much greater density in order to meet the challenge of the moment. And, in, and again, uh, uh, what's very clear in this project is that it is based again, as many of the others, on understanding the collaborative spirit that defines our present day. So these are a series of projects, and I'm, I'm reaching the limit of my time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of stop here. Uh, but I'm, um, the, the thing that I'm trying to emphasize is that when we, when we look at what typological reasoning offers, it begins to give us uh, a way of looking at the possibilities in a plan that works with an idea of freedom that is emphasizing uh, the capacity to act in a, in a fresh way. Now, uh, one of the things that Kipnis is, um, is, is often uh, noticing in the work of um, OMA is something that he calls a disestablishing reduction uh, in their attitude towards worn out institutions, worn out approaches to type. Uh, and in, he says that the reason why they're so productive in terms of their uh, vision for um, cultural buildings, for housing, for schools and libraries and so on, is that they are, uh, as a practice, they are able to focus on getting rid of all that seems to be worn out uh, or is no longer timely in relation to history and to clear out, in a way, all of the, the remnants of a disabling spatiality. Now, uh, along with that, of course, you can see that the argument, and you can see that very much in Pavlos's um, um, uh, exploration of the, um, of the work in Porto, is that it's very much not based simply upon an optics that tries to uh, find conformity with an existing fabric, but is instead, again, about that displacement of concepts. Now, um, in, in Fashid Musavi's recent book, The Function of Style, I mean, I think one of the things that's very, very clear and interesting in that is the sense that we can look at architecture as responding to changes in a way of living. And this is a point that has been made by Alex Anderson in his book on uh, Corb and Eileen Gray and a number of others, who in the early part of the 20th century said, uh, we live differently today, and consequently we need different houses. And Anderson's argument is that these people thought from the dwelling and the nature of teapots and chairs and tables and, uh, and desks and thought about the way in which we use these things in such a different way that the house we used to have was no longer appropriate. And from that began to think outward till it extended to an understanding of the city. Uh, now I think in a similar way, uh, if we look at some of what's going on in, uh, in the work of OMA, there they're constantly working against an architectural standard and they're constantly working against, in a sense, a received tradition. 
but not so much by simply rejecting it and, and you know, sort of saying, well, why don't we all be nomads or something like that. In a way, what they do is they begin to suggest, actually, what we really need to do is to clarify how that institution, which we still wish to uphold, whether that's the institution of the home or whether it's the institution of the library, must go through some fairly fundamental reductive rethinking by reductive, that is, in a kind of emptying out, freeing up, making it possible for new kinds of uh, collaborative relations to appear. Now, um, in all of these, um, in all of these uh, kinds of examples, the, the argument that I would be wanting to get at is that uh, we should be deploying typological reasoning in a way that is more associated with social learning. That is, it is based upon a kind of clarification of today's values. Uh, and it is done in, the, in relationship to relatively small groups of action. You don't want to turn it into a blanket regulatory mechanism. You don't even want to turn it into a 200 hectare master plan with one formal preoccupation. Instead, what you want to do is, is use it to build a capacity to deal with the problem of risk. So if we come back to uh, the Hoffman City project, it starts with super achievable simple types and then tries to enable uh, government, tenants, uh, developers, and um, in a sense the broad stakeholder base to understand how to make use of a relatively simple type before moving on to another. Uh, if we take the way in which the London legacy development uh, um, planning has tended to work, it sort of assumes that risk will always be the same. Uh, and so it, you know, it seems not to create a capacity, a built-in capacity to move from one state of understanding a risk in a particular place to being able to meet that standard, meet that challenge, and then increase our capacity to develop taller, more complex, more layered, more collaborative, more mixed buildings, and, and introduce sophistication. Instead, it just keeps on banging away at the same sort of single function environments with a couple of exceptions. But it doesn't, as a matter of principle, create the capacity for uh, developing a, a more freed up, collaborative environment in keeping with today's patterns. Uh, so in that sense, this displacement of concepts is aimed at creating what uh, a, a complex environment of, of shared ambitions rather than um, uh, the a more essential reduction like what we, I think, see in some versions of typology that try to reduce it down to a kind of simplified essential geometry. So I think instead it's a, this version of it is about introducing the problem of history and the problem of the moment into conjunction with uh, the, an understanding of uh, the, the, the opportunities of form. Thank you very much.